Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 29th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we explain why, despite having many spending champions, there's no one in the legislature or the administration for that matter, focused on making sure the spending is paid for in a way that has the lowest impact on Alaska families. Second, We explain that while it's good to hear Governor Dunleavy finally weighing in on an issue forcefully, he's threatening a veto over the wrong thing. And third, we explain why the legislature should stop chasing squirrels and let the market get on deciding with Cook Inlet gas. And now, let's join Michael. Well, let's uh, let's uh, let's get started. So, you've got a whole thing about. There are legislative champions, uh, different kinds of champions, apparently, for for spending and more. So tell us, g- give us, give us the rundown here. You you take the you take the lead here. So so you can come in and snatch me along. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna snatch you right off the podium here in a minute. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so I've been as I've been reading through the press and talking to people and other things over the past few weeks, actually. But it's sort of it's sort of you know came to a roar the past week, I've noticed, I, I, I've, I've come to realize that there are champions down in the legislature and indeed in the, in the administration sometimes for various spending things. Uh, I mean, K through 12 comes to mind. You've got Senator Stevens, President Stevens in the Senate. You got Loki to- Tobin, Senator Loki Tobin, who's, who presses ahead uh, on uh, K through 12. And you've got all sorts of people in the House, uh, former teachers in the House who are pressing ahead, current or former teachers in the House, who are pressing for uh, more K through 12 spending. On energy, you sort of shift over to the Republicans. You got George Rauscher, who's, you know, all, all excited about pursuing energy projects and, and, and Jesse Sumner, who wants to, you know, do a, a state subsidy of the, of the line down from the gas line down from the North Slope. On defined benefits, you've got Kathy Giesel, certainly who's who's become something she wasn't back when she was first elected, a uh, pushing uh, pushing additional spending. You've got Jesse Keel from uh, uh, Juno, who's got all those constituents who want defined benefits, and so you've got you've got champions for that. And now you've got a new one this past week, Representative Julie Colomb, a Republican, conservative Republican uh, from Anchorage, is now pushing child care. Uh, tax credits, but all tax credits are tax expenditures, and you know who's going to pay the cost of those eventually. It's going to be additional PFD cuts. It's going to be, you know, pushed down to middle and lower income Alaska families. So she's become the new child care uh, advocate. What you don't have in the legislature are revenue efficiency experts, and I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment. But revenue efficiency experts or revenue efficiency champions. By by revenue efficiency, what I, I'm trying to distinguish it from from just revenue, because you know Mike Shower wants to make that a dirty word and has done a pretty good job doing that. Um, I, I'm not talking about additional revenue. Let me let me give you an example. I used to do when I was back a practicing lawyer. I used to do a lot of utility rate cases, and utility rate cases come in two parts. The first part is how much goes to the 
uh, utility, how much the utility is entitled to earn, how much is you entitled to collect in rates. And that's the revenue portion, the, 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 the utilities entitlement to, to revenue. And that's, that's a whole issue and gets, gets argued about, but after, but, but separate and apart from that issue is, is an issue called rate design or revenue design. And that's how you collect whatever the revenue is, not trying to increase the revenue, but just how you're trying to collect the revenue. And that's always a battle between uh, uh, residential customers, representatives of residential customers, commercial customers, and industrial customers. And in Alaska, we the the four, uh, the the J Bear is the sort of the equivalent of the industrial customer on the on the NSTAR system, for example. And it's always a battle about who should bear who should bear the cost. They're not trying to increase the cost. That's being set on a separate issue with separate arguments and separate separate uh, 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 contentions going back and forth. This argument, the revenue design, the rate design argument is just about who bears the cost. And there's a whole level of expertise and a whole level of, of championship, if you will, of uh, on that issue about who bears the costs. Utilities, the, the, the utilities are sort of agnostic. They don't care. Uh, the residential uh, customers always want to shift more of the cost to the commercial and industrial customers. The industrial customers always want to shift more of the cost to the residential customers. And you have this whole revenue design or rate design issue that goes back and forth that you spend a lot of the case. In fact, it's often more contentious than the than the overall revenue issue. There's a lot of contentiousness that goes that goes back and forth. And it's a whole level of expertise. You've got that in Alaska uh, in terms of how we shift. If you look at the government as the utility and the overall revenue level as whatever the heck the budget is, we've got a revenue design or a rate design issue in Alaska. How much should the oil companies bear? How much should the top 20% bear? How much should the other 80% middle and lower income uh, Alaska families bear. It's almost the equivalent of the industrial, commercial, residential divide you have you have in utility rate cases, and it takes a level of expertise to understand that. And there's all sorts of unintended consequences or or efficiencies or issues that come out of that. If you shift too much to the residentials, for example, are you going to encourage them to shift off gas onto electricity, or are you going to encourage them? Uh, to, to overspend on, on insulation and things like that. If you shift too much to the industrials, are you going to push them out of the state or push them out of the country uh, overseas? And there's all sorts of efficiency issues and economic issues that are involved in that. We've got the same thing with respect to, with respect to revenue levels in Alaska, recovery of revenue levels in Alaska. If, if you shift too much to the oil companies, will they leave? If you don't collect enough from the oil companies and you shift it too much, to, to, to the top 20%, will they do as Natasha said? People with money will leave. We've seen in the past week, the past couple of weeks, the consequence of shifting it too much to middle and lower income Alaska families. We have we have falling working at working level, uh, working age Alaska families in the middle and lower income brackets. We have an increasing number of them in the top 20%, but we have a falling number of them in the, in the uh, middle and lower income brackets. ICER told us in 2016 that you that you have the largest adverse impact on the overall economy if you shift it that way. And, and ICER also told us in 2017, you have by far the costliest impact on 80% of Alaska families if you shift it that way. It's a whole level of expertise. It's a whole level of, of economic issues that we ought to be digging into and ought to be understanding as, as the legislature and the administration decides how to shift it back and forth. But we have no champions. We have no experts in the legislature who are trying to do that. We used to have a couple in the administration. Uh, we had Brian Fector, who was the deputy director of revenue. And we have Colleen Glover, who was the director of tax, both of whom understood that issue because I talked with them about it regularly, both of whom understood that issue, both of whom were sensitive to the fact that if you overcollect from one group, Separate and apart from what the rev overall revenue is, if you collect from one group, over collect from one group, you're going to have unintended consequences. But Adam Crum fired them both because the oil companies didn't like what they were saying. 
And so we don't have anybody in the administration. We have a, depart a whole department of revenue that ought to, ought to be talking about this stuff, that, that ought to understand this stuff, and ought to be talking about this stuff. But we got nobody. So we got nobody in the legislature. Ben tried. Ben Carpenter tried. But, but it sort of hit a brick wall last year. Right. Um, and we've got nobody in the legislature who's really trying to understand this issue. I'm not, I'm not using revenue in the, in the same term that shower is when he says, Oh, revenue means taxes, bad, bad, bad revenue. Don't talk about revenue. I'm talking about revenue efficiency, revenue design. And that's what we need a champion on somebody who is focused on the consequences of, of, of re over recovering or how you recover the overall revenue, whatever it is, $2, five, five million dollars, whatever it is, how you recover that revenue amongst amongst the amongst the payers. And that is costing Alaska a lot. I mean, I I know we got people who want to spend more money. Oh, K-12, we need to spend more money. George Rauscher, we need to spend more money on energy. Jesse Sumner, we need to spend more money on energy. You know, defined benefits, Giesel and Keel, we need to spend more money. Now, Julie Cologne, I know we got people who who how to who know how to spend. And That's you know how to champion spending. We just don't we have, have we, we don't have people who understand how to recover it in a way that that helps Alaska. Yeah, we pretty much only have people who know how to spend. That's pretty much all we have these days. It's always it's a spend, but it's a spend on my program, not on your program, but on my program. So as long as I get my thing. That's just and righteous, and your thing is wrong and evil. And uh, like I said, it's gotten to the point now to where basically you've got the people who want more government and the people who want less government, and the people who want more government are pretty much the majority in everything at this point. They want to spend on everything. But but we don't but we don't understand we don't understand. However, that issue plays out: more government, less government. However, that issue plays out, we don't have anybody who's saying okay. There's the number. Got it. There's the rev. There's the revenue uh, uh, requirement. Got it. Yep. Now, how do we recover it in a in an efficient manner and in a manner that promotes Alaska, the pro promotes the Alaska economy, promotes Alaska families? You know, Governor Dunleavy says he wants to be the family governor. Well, PFD cuts are the worst thing for Alaska families. Promotes Alaska families and 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 solves helps solve the problem of the exodus of, of working Alaska, working age Alaska families, middle and lower income, working age Alaska families. We we need to have somebody talking about that also in the legislature, in the administration, and we don't. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top one. Off to a bang, man. He was on a roll. I didn't want to just didn't even want to interrupt him at this point because Again, he's not wrong. Uh, and of course, uh, with all the people out there that are wanting to, I was a little blown away by the fact that Cologne was, because she's been pretty good up till this point. Uh, and now, of course, we need uh, government to intervene on the child care because we just couldn't possibly figure out how to do it ourselves. Uh, if we could get government out of the way of child care and quit putting all the stupid regs and the things and the 16 pages worth of thousands of dollars worth of uh, of uh, things you need to do to even get started, maybe we could fix that. But no, what we need to do now is subsidize it because that's what, uh, you know, you incentivize it, then you subsidize it, then you, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy, crazy thing. Terry says, let the top 20 leave. Maybe we can get our state street. You don't, you're missing the point. It's not the top 20 who are leaving. It's the average working age people. The top 20 are actually increasing. It's becoming a haven for them. That's the that's the whole point. Everybody else is paying and they get a chance to sit here and retain all their money. So there you go. That's that's what it's about, Terry, uh, at that point. Um, <clears throat> what else we got here? State shower, uh, state Senator Mike Shower had a great article on defined benefits on his Facebook page. We'll have to read that as well. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that was supposed to happen. That was supposed to happen yesterday, uh, and it didn't. Uh, looked like it was going to, and they were just going to jam it down the throats of all. Looked like it was going to be a seventeen to seventeen to three vote, and then they figured out that they couldn't get the that the senators weren't going to arrive because of the weather. So then they moved it off again. But uh, according to according to what I'm hearing, they haven't even finished the fiscal note analysis of this yet. Uh, the 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 new benefit bill, Brad. It's going to cost over 1.2 billion dollars over the next 15 years, but 
that's the incomplete report. They're saying that they're not even going to have the next report. It's going to be over a month before they see the preliminary numbers, but they're trying to pass it right now. So they have an incomplete fiscal note, have no idea how much it's going to cost, and they're going to vote for it because of all the good things that it's going to bring, supposedly. Yeah. Let's let's pass it, then we'll read it, or let's pass it, then we'll yeah, then we'll, we'll figure out what's in it. Yeah, we'll figure out what's in it once we pass it. And and I and I haven't updated updated my knowledge lately, but we still have what a seven billion dollar, six billion dollar, five billion dollar yeah, deficit out of the current billion. benefits program. Yeah, between six and seven billion deficit on the on the on the past program. That's uh, that it's it was ended in twenty fourteen. Yeah, so you know, just adding to that. I mean, there was a time. Uh, in the early 20 teens, when we were going, when, when the retirement benefits, the state supplement to the retirement benefits, um, to, to close the gap was going to be near the largest category of spending. Yeah. Um, and, and Anna Fairchild, uh, Senator Anna, then Senator Anna Fairchild, uh, uh, quietly moved as, as she was chair of finance. then I think quietly moved $3 billion uh, out of the earnings reserve over into the defined benefits program. You know, if you wonder where, if you wonder where all the earnings reserve money is gone. No, it was out, it was out of the CBR. She moved the money out of the CBR over into the, uh, over into the defined benefits program to put more principal over there. So it could earn more. So the, so the cost of the state to close the gap was, was less uh, or else, or else the, the number would have, would have gone, would have gone way up. So, yeah, we need to see the fiscal note before we before we we go off on this tangent again, or else we're going to find ourselves in another situation where well, yeah, closing the gap may cost us more than everything else in the budget. And it wasn't just the state; it was all the municipalities and all the cities that had participated in the defined benefits, and they were on the hook for their surprise. Here you have to pay for all this bad. And it was, it was, I said, 2014 uh, defined benefits ended in 2006. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, so we're talking 20 years ago, we're still $6 billion in the hole after being out of defined benefits business for 20 years, uh, 18 years, here we are. And they want to jump right back into it. They have the shortest memory in history, <laughs> the shortest memory in history. Wouldn't it be great if we could have everything all our cake and eat it too, and ponies and butterflies and rainbows. Couldn't we? It wouldn't it just be great if we could have it all and just have our own printing presses and do whatever we want to do? That's where it's at. Well, that's I mean, that's 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 sort of where we've gotten to again. I mean, we've got we've got all these champions for all these spending categories, and we're adding them as we go. I mean, Cologne added hers right, uh, right. this week. We're we're adding them as we go, but we've got nobody worrying about the consequences of how we pay for it. Yeah. Who pays? That's the question. Who pays? Somebody ought to be asking that. Oh, wait, we are asking that question. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, continues with us now. Let's uh, jump back into number two. The governor says he's going to veto, but is he vetoing the right thing? Uh, Brad, uh, the governor says any standalone bill that increases the funding for schools without a comprehensive something or other is going to get you know, no standalone funding bills for just the BSA. Uh, is that the right thing? The wrong thing? Give me your thoughts. Well, first, first of all, this is this is a, a huge exception. Step out for this for this governor. While while it's normal in other states and at the federal level for the chief executive, the president, or the governor to say, "If you pass this, I'm going to veto it." So don't spend your time working on it. Let's work on something that that you know that 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 reaches all of our, reaches all of our issues. This governor's never done that. I mean, I remember when there were some who said, tell the legislature, you're going to veto the appropriations bill, the whole damn thing. If it doesn't include a full PFD, or if it doesn't include POMB 50, 50, back up your statements with respect to the PFD by telling the legislature, no, he wouldn't do that. No, you know, I, I just, I'm just going to sit here and wait until the legislature passes something. And then I'll think about it. Uh, was was basically was basically his attitude, and he's done that continually through both the first term and into the second term. Finally, he stands up and he says, you know, last week he stands up and he says, well, I'm going to veto any bill that just increases the just increases the BSA. Period. I'm going to veto any bill that just increases the BSA. Well, what does that guarantee? What that guarantees is then that it's going to have to include a bunch of other things, which is what he intends. 
But here's the deal. It's going to include a big BSA. I mean, between the Senate and the and the House, there's going to be a big BSA that's going to that's going to be included as part of this bill. And now the governor has said it needs to include all that other stuff because I'm going to veto a, B, a, a bill that just comes to me with a big BSA number. So you're going to have to add in all that other stuff, the cost of all that other stuff on top of whatever the big BSA number is. And that's what the that's that's what's going to go to the governor out of the legislature. The governor and, and the governor said, well, you know, I told you I wouldn't I would veto a BSA only bill. But now that you that you've added in all that other stuff, even though it's got a big BSA and now you've added in all that other stuff, uh, I'm going to be prepared to sign it because you put all the other stuff in that I want. As we talked on the show last week, we're talking potentially about a, 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 a bill that goes from two hundred million dollars. Well, from 80 million, 86 million dollars, which is what which is what the add on was to the BSA last year, the one time add on after the governor vetoed half of it. We're talking about a bill that goes from 86, uh, 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 an add on to, to K through 12 that goes from 86 million dollars. Potentially, if the BSA goes high enough and then you add on all that other stuff the governor wants, potentially to a bill that approaches a, a half a billion dollars, 500 million dollars. And that's, I mean, that's how Congress solves things, right? I've got to have my thing. Well, okay, I'll give you your thing, but you give me my thing. Okay, well, I'll give you your thing. And pretty soon, you know, the bills, the bills just spiraled out of control. If the governor had said instead, I'm going to veto anything that has more than $250 million or $200 million, a number um, that, that, that spends more than that, because we can't afford to spend any more than that. I'm not even sure how we're going to spend that but we can't afford to spend any more. I'm not sure how we're going to fund that, but we can't afford to spend any more than that. I'm going to veto a bill and it has to have, and it has to have my stuff in it too. If he had, if he'd put a cap on the number, then we would have an effective negotiation going on in the legislature fighting about what, what, who got in underneath the $250 million. But by leaving the dollar figure open-ended, and saying all he's saying is it can't include just the BSA. You know, if I'm Gary Stevens, I'm sitting there going, "Great, I'm done. I, you know, I'll give you whatever the heck it is you want, whatever all that other stuff is, right, um, right. as long as I get my six, my thousand dollar BSA or my thirteen hundred dollar BSA." And right, I thought we were going to argue about it, but instead, you're going to you all you you just just make sure that there's more than just the BSA in there. I could fix that. Yeah, exactly right. And, and, you know, and it's just, it's going to be the same sort of stuff we have in Congress about, okay, I'll give you all your stuff. You give me my stuff. And, you know, the other side says the reverse. I'll give you all your stuff. If you give me my stuff, that's, that's what we're going to have. The, the governor, I mean, this is another, another fiscal issue. Another, you know, the fact we don't have anybody in the administration that understands numbers. Uh, it's another issue where the governor is just, you know, opening up the bank accounts um, and saying, you know, I don't, yeah, spend what you want, but I've got to have my stuff in here. And, and he's just, uh, he, he's vetoing the wrong thing. He finally got the guts to say after how many, six years, is that how long we've been at this? After six years, he finally got the guts to stand up and say, I'll veto something. I mean, Ben Carpenter practically begged him last year to do something like that with respect to, with respect to the budget to increase the house, the house's, uh, leverage against the Senate on the PFD issue. He's finally got the guts to do that, but now he's now he's chosen something that's going to cost us even more. I mean, it, it 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 it's not a budget item that he's finally standing on. It's it's a an issues uh, uh, issue that he's going to finally stand on. That's just going to end up costing us more. And I, you know, after a while, you just sort of wonder what who's advising him. You know, who's running numbers? Who's thinking through the issues? Uh, who's worrying about, you know, revenue. Well, nobody's thinking about revenue design. We fired the people who thought about revenue design. I mean, after a while, you just wonder what this administration is, is doing, what they're thinking. Uh, they're biding time until they can get tapped for some bigger program. That's, that's where they're at right now. That's exactly what's uh, going on. Um, <clears throat> you know, when you look at this and like you said, why would they not embrace this why would the the opposing the quote-unquote opposing sides on this why would they not embrace this when they say <clears throat> we can have whatever we want as long as we include all this other stuff in it 
it becomes the smorgasbord. I mean, it is the stereotypical Christmas tree bill where you could plug anything into it as long as you get all these other things. You can have your BSA increase as long as we get all this other stuff. Um, and, and and quite honestly, this has been part of my complaint with uh, Dunleavy from the beginning is that just this weak sauce of, uh, you know, he wouldn't take a stand for the longest time and now he takes a stand and it's the wrong one. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's... um. It, it, they'll go through Kabuki theater. I mean, they'll go through, oh, charter school's bad. You know, charter schools ought to come through the local school. We'll have all those sorts of battles. And we'll have all those sorts of battles about, you know, the, the teacher uh, 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 pay raises or the teacher bonuses. We'll, we'll, we'll go through all the Kabuki theater about that. But at the end, it's going to be, you give me what I want. I'll give you what you want. And, 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 and we'll just, we'll join together and we'll give the governor what he wants. We'll give him all that other stuff. Oh, and the price tag, he'll be, he'll be like defined benefits. Yeah, we haven't run the fiscal note on that. It's going to be something. We know that. Uh, but, uh, but, but it's, I mean, we, no, no one, no one is thinking about the, fisc, the state's fiscal situation. I mean, basically, we had a couple of editorials in the ADN last week that basically said, we got lots of money. See all this permanent fund earnings, uh, that, that, that 5% POMV that, that we've got off the, that's a lot of money. We got a lot of money. Don't worry about, don't worry about money. We've got, we ought to be spending more. We ought to be spending more on K through 12. We ought to be spending more on the university. We ought, but we, we got lots of money. I mean, that's, that's the attitude we've come to. That's the, that's the problem, uh, that, you know, everybody's fallen into by looking at the, the 5% draw first. And then saying that, you know, the PMV comes down, comes down as one of the spending categories. We ought to be saying, look at the, look at the 5% less the PFD, which is, which is what the statute says. And then let's deal with that money. And then we'd be talking about budget restraints, but now everybody's sort of fallen into this. We got lots of money. Don't worry about it. I mean, you're not wrong. Rob Myers says when you get a, when you Christmas tree a bill, be careful it doesn't fall on you. I mean, that's exactly I mean, this is <clears throat> this is how we this is how we crush ourselves is just keep throwing things at it and getting everything we want. And uh, it again, it reminds me of the de Tocqueville, you know, woe be unto the republic when they figure out they can vote themselves largesse out of the public treasury. That's where we're at right now is that they're just like, oh, we can do it. We can do child care. We can do this and we can do that. And we can do all these other things, education and health care. And we could just do it all. Don't worry about it. Um, and, and it'll just continue. Oh, and and we've got this, we've got this declining uh, uh, number of people in working age Alaskans. Oh, well, we'll just solve that by spending more money by taking it out of the pockets of working age Alaskans and making it worse. But 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 don't worry. I, we're not even going to think about that. We'll just spend more money. We'll just throw more money at working age Alaskans. You know, Fairbanks will 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 increase the 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 property tax. Anchorage will have a sales tax. We now have the Anchorage uh, Industrial or the Anchorage uh, Economic Development Corporation saying we ought to have a sales tax in Anchorage. We'll just we'll just throw more money at it. Don't worry about it. We're not gonna we're not gonna worry about whether our our current policies are part of causing the problem. Right. Well, they're taking money out of the pockets of middle and lower income Alaska families is actually contributing to the problem. We're not going to worry about that. We're just going to throw more money at it. Grab more, yeah. mo grab more money from the very people that are leaving. Yeah. And look, I mean, look at, like you said, look what happens in Fairbanks here. We've had a tax cap and a revenue cap there for the last 30 years. It's voted on every two years. They've gathered the signatures. Now, all of a sudden, the assembly has decided, oh, well, we're going to go ahead and put an ordinance up to have a special election in 90 days to change that and add another $10 million to it for education, even though we can't dedicate it. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. It, it, this is for the children, don't you know? And, uh, you know, just ignore the fact that you collected all these signatures for the October ballot and we're going to get in ahead of you with a special election that only benefits special interests that only, I mean, it just, at some point you're just like, man, somebody just needs to strike a match and watch the world burn because the, the, nothing is going to change. Nothing is changing. And, and, and part of it, Michael, I, I contend part of it, going back to the first issue is part of it is we have nobody who's focused on the consequences of shifting more money onto the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families, more and more of the burden onto the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families. It's like it's, it's like a utility rate case where you just shift more and more onto the residentials. 
and somebody and you know re, you start losing residential so you have to shift even more to them and somebody says why are we losing residentials uh because their costs are going up oh yeah well maybe we ought to do <laughs> i mean so maybe we ought to subsidize them maybe we ought to you know bring in more state money and subsidize them not thinking that the burden you're putting on them is the very problem and, right. And you're you just, causing you the problem and your new solution is to cause more of the problem by subsidizing them and requiring more money from the same people that you were taking money from to begin with. It's not robbing Peter to pay Paul. It's robbing Peter to pay Peter. Exactly. I mean, I mean, at what point do you just go, wait, and by the way, that costs money for, to take money from Peter's pocket and put it back in because you've got to handle it and everything else. And that's how government grows. Exactly. Right. So we, but we have nobody in government. We have nobody in the legislature. Ben tried, but Ben's not talking about it this session. Nobody in the legislature who's trying to say, look at the consequences of this revenue shift, this, re this, this revenue design shift that you're doing. Look at the consequences of that and stop that. Right. Equalize it or, or you know, make it, make it more rational before you pile any more on. And but but we got nobody in the legislature who's doing that. It's just more, spend more, spend more. Judy Cologne, spend more, spend more on child care. It's just I I mean yeah. yeah, no, at some point you're like you just want to throw your hands up in the air when you're watching this stuff and you're just like more and more people and you see them fall away. You're like people are like, oh man, they've been spot on. The next thing you know, they're like Oh, I think we should increase the government spend on this or subsidize it or give it a tax or or do something or regulate it. And I'm just like, oh, my God, what is I mean, we just apparently have missed the whole we apparently missed the whole thing, uh, just just missed everything. Um, and there's no there's no solving it at that point. There is just no solve when everybody is so entrenched and so. um uh, I mean, what, I guess, what do, how do I put this? Uh, when everybody is so, uh, uh, is a beneficiary of whatever is happening, when they're so invested in the whole system in a certain way, you can't start throwing wrenches at it because everyone would, oh, well, we couldn't do that. We'd be harmed. You know, my constituents would be harmed or my constituent. And pretty soon, okay, so you're going to ride this train right over the gulch into the gully and it's going to burst into flames. Well, at least our people won't be hurt before then. I mean, put the brakes on. No, 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 we couldn't do that. That might hurt their feelings. And so instead, we'll just ride it into a fiery death in the chasm below. Okay. Oh. Or Gary Stevens, I'm going to retire after my next election. Just make sure I get through with exactly passing, He's like, passing everything I, I want before. I couldn't possibly do that, except I will pull the ripcord right at the edge of the valley and ride the parachute out of here while you guys are crashing into the chasm below. And here's, so, here's the deal, Michael. The Alaska system is set up for the governor to be a counterbalance to all that, right? For the legislature to, to go hog wild, do whatever they do. But but the Constitution gives gives the Alaska governor huge powers. I mean, he just demonstrated some of those powers with all these executive orders, huge powers to control what the legislature is doing. But this governor, I mean, from the very beginning, has rolled back and said, no, 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 no. Let, let's wait till the legislation you know gets to my desk and. Then you know. Then I'll decide what to do. We just time. wasted. We just wasted twenty weeks waiting for the legislation to get to your desk before you gave us a, a direction you were going to go. Well, well, and we got all of our constituencies engaged, right? You go engage all of your constituencies, get them all hopped up about this, get them all excited about it, get them all you know pent up and driving and and with you know with rallies here and there and everywhere. And then I'll just sit here and at the end, I'll say no. And and we saw what happened in 2019 when that, when he tried that. I mean, it's, it, it, it the, the, the way the Alaska system is set up, the governor's supposed to be a counterbalance. The governor's supposed to be active. The governor's supposed to take a role. The governor's supposed to give guidance. The governor's supposed to lead. This is the first time in all honesty, I can remember the governor issuing a veto threat. In, in the six years, the first time I can remember the, and it's on the wrong thing. It's on, it's on, it's on the thing that's going to result in increased costs, increased budget. I mean, it's just, again, I don't know who's advising him. I don't know how all of this is, is put together in the administration, but it's just, 
the the Alaska has gone off the rails because the governor is not exercising the power the Alaska Constitution intentionally gives the governor to right. keep it on the rails. He's one of the strongest governors in the country. He has more power than almost any other governor in the country. And this one's just kind of laid back and watched things happen, unfortunately. I mean, I, there is no other governor in the country that I can think of. And I follow a lot of them fairly closely. There's no other governor in the country who says, pass whatever you want. I'll think about it when it finally gets to my desk. I don't want to interfere in your process. Pass whatever you want. And, and let, get all your constituencies lined up, get everybody engaged, get the public all excited about it. And then, you know, whenever it gets here, I'll think about it. I, I know of no other governor in the country that, that does it that way. Every other governor is engaged. Even, the gov even weak governors get engaged and say, look, you know, I know you can, I know you can, you know, ride my ass out of town if I do this, but, but I'm going to veto if you, if you go this way. And every other governor that I've, that I've come across says stuff like that. The president says that stuff, love or hate Biden, love or hate Trump. I mean, at least they issued veto threats. This governor, six years, no veto threats. And now when we finally get it, it's not, to, it's not to lower cost. It's to increase spending by making sure that his stuff gets included with whatever gets, gets run up on the BSA. I just, I, when we go over, when we go over the edge, it's going to be because this governor did not exercise the powers the Alaska Constitution envisioned that a governor would use to keep a lat to keep the state on the rails. Yeah, no, absolutely, and that's the worst part is that he, this could this was all preventable, and he has just been very wishy washy. Standing tall, probably not the greatest campaign slogan at this point. More like slinking off to Bethlehem, um, kind of thing. It's it's a it's a rough deal. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Donna says, by the way, she goes. That's true about all the governors I've worked with. They were strong governors. They took a stand. They needed to do what they needed to do. Brad Keithley, our guest, the weekly top three. We're on to number three right now which is all about Cook Inlet and the gas. And uh, Brad says, man, just let the market decide, um, which, uh, you know, I wish I wish that could happen. But it just seems like there's been so much intervention in the market at this point that I don't know. Maybe it's what it takes is to get. Oh, what am I saying? It doesn't take more government to get things unscrewed. It takes less government. But, you know, that's the answer that seem, people seem to be playing at this point, Brad. There have been a couple of uh, articles in the past week that I think uh, are important from a Cook Inlet standpoint. One is, one was in the ADN, a, a piece by Alex DeMarbin, headlined, NSTAR President Warns of Natural Gas Shortfall Delayed Solutions for South Central Alaska. And the other is a piece uh, in uh, Nat Hertz's Northern Journal that's a mid-cold snap equipment failure stresses Alaska's natural gas uh, delivery system, which is about a, an issue in the in the Singza, uh, the Cook Inlet uh, natural gas storage uh, uh, facility, um, and 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 both of those are essentially saying, look, you know, we're we're working our way into into trouble here. We need a solution. Here's my problem with what's going on in the legislature. The legislature is milling about, thinking this is an issue they need to intervene in. You know, George Rauscher's got his solutions. Jesse Sumner has his solutions. I'm sure there's going to be solutions. Uh, well, yeah, I, there are solutions that, that that some are milling about on the on the Senate side. Yeah, and and we've got and and then we've got this funding for the for the AKLNG project that everybody's saying, well, that's part of the solution. So we need to continue to fund them, and we need we need to continue that project that's going nowhere, frankly. But but we need to we need to continue we we need to continue that project. And you're sending a bunch of mixed signals to the utilities, leaving them with the impression that maybe they're going to get bailed out. I mean, maybe Ada is going to buy, you know, Bluecrest and maybe, you know, go in and, and save the day by subsidizing the production of gas out of the, out of the cosmopolitan field, or maybe they're going to buy John Hendricks's hex, John Hendricks's fields um, and, and save the day, kitchen lights fields and save the day by producing out of them. You know, so if I'm John Sims sitting at NSTAR, I'm going, what the hell do you want me to do? I mean, here, here's the legislature saying, here's a bunch of solutions we're working on. Don't, don't do anything drastic. 
here's a bunch of bunch of sol solutions we're working on. In the meantime, John's got wells sanding up back in the storage facility that that lowers his ability to respond to spike peaks um, in uh, in South Central, and 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 we have declines going on, natural declines going on in, in the in the Cook Inlet fields, and John's sitting there going, I I don't know what you want me to do. I mean. And the and the and the regulatory commission of Alaska, which is the government agency charged and given the authority and given the ability to regulate what the utilities do to make sure it's in the public interest, they're sitting there going, I don't know what you want me to do. The legislature's off, you know, talking about 20 different things, and they may do one and it may be, you know, inconsistent with what I tell them to do. And I don't want to get I don't want to get crosswise with the legislature. The legislature needs to get the hell out of the way. The legislature needs to stop all this, you know, pie in the sky stuff. Jesse Sumner's will subsidize, will subsidize a line down from the slope. You know, George Rauscher's will, will, you know, eliminate royalty in the Cook Inlet, and that'll incentivize people to do things. Ada's, oh, we're going to buy Cosmopolitan, or we're going to buy, we're going to buy the Kitchen Lights Field, and 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 will will solve the problem. The legislature needs to get the hell out of the way, and let the market decide. What is the best approach? Let NSTAR decide. Let the, let the electric utilities decide what the best approach is. Take it to the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, which is already set up to do this stuff. Don't need the legislature involved. Regulatory Commission of Alaska to, to, to look at it, to, to agree or change whatever the hell they think, and get on with whatever they're doing. I mean, you, you, I have this vision, talking about train wrecks, I have this vision where we're speeding along toward, you know, toward uh, the, the edge of the cliff from an energy standpoint, John Sims is trying to say, hey, we need to put on the brake or we need to lay some different track or we need to slow the engine down or we need to direct the engine in a different way. And the legislature is saying, oh, no, no, don't do that yet. You know, let us think about it and let us, let us, you know, cogitate over it and let us take time and let us, and maybe we'll have a task force that'll think about this stuff. I mean, it's just, <laughs> Maybe we'll study the study that we studied before that was studying the previous study that was engaged for the before. I mean, that's that's where we're at, right? Meanwhile, the cliff is getting closer and closer and closer. George Rauscher, you need to get out of the way. Jesse Sumner, you need to get out of the way and and let the market decide how we're going, how, how to best respond to the situation. If it's LNG for a period of time, it's LNG for a period of time. Frankly, what I think happens, to be honest, is I think if LNG is going to come in, we're going to see the market, the 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 cost uh, in uh, of gas in South Central rise, and we'll see Hillcorp suddenly say, "Oh, wait, well the cost is going to be that high. I can undercut that by five cents and bring in some additional supplies. You've now given me an incentive to do it." But but instead of letting the market operate, instead of letting the market go forward. Instead of, letting, instead of letting the RCA does what the legislature set it up to do, the legislature is just muddying the waters hugely. And, and, and they need to stop that and let, and let NSTAR get on with this business, let the electric utilities get on, get on with their business, and let the RCA get on with its business, business, and let's stop this before the train goes over the cliff. Well, this is because they have, the, again, the, the secondary politician disease. The first politician's disease is we know better than you how to do whatever. The second politician's disease is we must do something. Oh, there's a crisis? We must do something about it. Instead of letting it sort itself out, instead of letting market forces or, or inertia or other things work out, they have to intervene in some way so that they are seen you know, so they are seen to be doing something about it uh, at this point. I mean, we heard all about it. Oh, people are leaving. It's the high cost of energy. Well, we must do something about the high cost of energy. Well, maybe if you got the hell out of the way and, you know, got, you know, stopped the governmental interference and increased all, maybe it's the same thing with child care. Well, okay, it's child care is so expensive. Why is it so expensive? Well, because you got all this regulation, because people got to jump through all these hoops, because they got to do this stuff. They got to invest $10,000 to be able to start up the thing just to babysit. And then what do you, I mean, you know, what do you do? Get out of the way. No, we've got to be seen doing something. That's yeah. what it's about. It, it's a hero complex. And I'll, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll tell Jesse and George this, you may turn in to be the goat. You may turn in to be the goats. If you keep delaying getting in the way of market forces deciding what's going on, you may end up being the cause of the train going over the edge. And, and I, for one, am going to be saying that at the time the train goes over the edge. 
because you were the ones that muddied the water and didn't let the private sector end star and didn't let the government agency you've set up to deal with this stuff, the Regulatory Commission of Alaska, you're the ones that, that got in the way. I know you want to, you know, save South Central consumers pennies uh, and, and, and be seen as the hero lowering rates, but you're screwing the damn thing up. You're, you're screwing up the operation of the market that, that finds solutions to these things. I mean, utilities think through these things. They spend a lot of time thinking through these things. They know what the tools are. They know right. how, to, how to bring the tools forward. Just get out of the way. Stop well, muddying the water. And utilities plan in terms of decades, not in terms of next election cycle. I just want to point that out. So utilities are thinking more long term where everybody else is like, well, this will look good on my next election. As I sit down there and say, look, I saved you three and a half cents on your utility bill. I saved it. I mean, that's the problem right there. Like I could see it. I could see what you're talking about. I can understand it. I can agree with it. And everybody else just like nothing to see here. Move along. It'll just be fine. Let them do it. Fine, fine. Just fine. Reminds me of that meme of the dog sipping coffee in the coffee house while the place is burning down. And he's like, this is fine, fine, just fine. I mean, you know, you're like, what the hell is going on? Yeah, it's a it, it's a hero complex. I mean, we've got we've got legislators who want to be heroes to their constituencies. They want to they want to spend, they want to spend, they want to spend and, and satisfy their constituencies. Or they or in the yeah, well, in the governor's case, he wants he won't say he is, but he wants to spend because he wants his stuff and he's willing to let the BSA come in too as long as he gets as long as he gets to his stuff. We got nobody, nobody, and and and, and it's in part because we've made revenue a bad word, right? We've got nobody thinking about the revenue design side. We've got nobody thinking about the consequences of where we're of where we're getting all this damn money and where we're going to continue to get all this damn money to keep spending. I understand we want to stop spending, but it's not happening, folks. And so the question is, question is, where are we getting the money? Somebody, somebody in the legislature, somebody in the administration should be concerned about that, and they're not. Somebody in the legislature should be an expert on that, should be talking about that. And they're not. And 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 yeah, as I said, the people we had in the administration who were who were knowledgeable and talked about that, they're gone because they because they talked about that. They talked about oil companies could stand more. Oh no, God, we got to get rid of them. I mean, it's just right. <laughs> no, we couldn't possibly. Oh, you're gone. I'm sorry, you're gone. <laughs> Anybody else, my lord? You'd like me to fire while I'm here? Oh no, okay. I'm sure it'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Oh, I I don't I I'm not sure it was Crumb responding to Dunleavy. I think it was just Crumb. Getting ready to run for governor. Oh wait, well, I want the old I want the old company money when I run for governor. So that's what I mean. My lord was not done leaving. My lord, oh. was the oil companies. Yes, my lord. Is there anyone else you'd like me to fire before I run for governor and you fill my coffers with your with your lucre, sweet sweet lucre? Yeah, unlimited unlimited campaign funding. But that's that's another that's that's another subject that that I can spend hours on. It's we are. It, if there's any legislators out there looking for, you know, something that they could do to be positive, become experts in revenue design, become experts in, in rate design, help Ben Carpenter. I mean, the most frustrating piece I had last year was Ben stood up, talked about sales taxes, not perfect, but better than PFD cuts. And given, given the, given the revenue level that we're given the revenue spending that we're doing, the revenue take that we, that we need, not perfect. Ben Carpenter getting up and, and talking about that, taking the slings and arrows and doing that. And 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 Republicans who Democrats criticized him for weird reasons, but Republicans, you know, not backing him up. Good Lord, guys. What do you I mean? This is how the world works. This is the things we ought to be concerned about. You now say, oh, my God, losing all these working families, working age families. How did that ever happen? We have spent. No, you caused it. <laughs> you're contributing to it. Look at the damn numbers. Look at who you're taking money from and look who's not coming. It's you. You're the ones that are causing it. But oh no, they can't they can't be bothered by that. We're trying so to be the heroes, but we ended up being the villains. How did that work? Right? You know? And, and that, I mean that's really what it's all about. You're right. It's a hero complex. We must be seen to be doing something to save them from themselves. Instead of just standing out of the way and letting them all figure it out on their and, and get stuff done, it's wow. It's just wow. Yeah, yeah. We must be doing seem to be doing something to save them from themselves. 
at the same time that you're actually doing the thing that causes the problem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're I, the ones who created the problem, but now we're here to fix it. Here I come to save the day, even though I put you in the way. I mean, it's, you know, it, it, yeah. And you, you see that all across. I mean, you see that through all three segments. You see that in all of these spending champions that we got. You see that in the governor vetoing the wrong thing. And you see it in the, even in the cook inlet gas, where by muddying the waters, they're, they're preventing, they're, they're creating these muddy waters that the, that the private sector doesn't know how to get through. Oh, we, we want to be seen as heroes. We don't know quite how we can be heroes, but we want to be seen as heroes. So we're going right. to talk about a bunch of stuff and delay getting on with the solution that the free market tells you to do. <laughs> this plays so well into my next segment. I, you have no idea how this is just going to play. So, because I mean, I got people who are like, oh, you, you seen what the, what the Senator, the, the, the Dan Sullivan and the thing and the war talk. And, the, and I'm just like, does it really matter? Because you can't affect that anyway. You know, I mean, this thing is on rails at this point. I, I mean, I just got to say, t- Jim just said 37 car pileup says Alaska. He's not wrong. Here we are. We're, we're on the, you know, we could see it coming and nobody's put, nobody's stepping on the brake. Nobody's taking their foot off the gas. They're just like, okay, here we go. And at some point you just got to kind of realize it's going to happen. <laughs> and, so, and so you might as well just, you know, you might as well just brace, make sure you're strapped in and your family's strapped in and every, cause going along for the ride. Cause that's, what's going to happen. It's eventually going to crash. And then what are you going to do? Well, if you were smart enough to plan for it and prepare for it, there you go, Brad. Yeah, there you go. I, I, yeah. I mean, I don't want to be negative, but I mean, I'm trying to be realistic here. That's the bottom line. Realism. Well, this segment, th- this part of the show is all about pointing out the issues that, that are going to cause us to crash. And I, and I don't know how to stop it. I'm not, I'm not sure I know how to, how to stop sounding the warning bells. So, well, yeah. no, don't, you don't stop. You don't stop with sounding the warning bells, but at the meantime, you're also strapping yourself in and putting the seatbelts on and doing all that other stuff. Right. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah, what yeah. it comes down to. Well, I do have my seat. I do have my seat belts ready. So good, uh, that, good, that's, good. That's a good observation. Uh, I got about a minute and a half, Brad. We'll give you the final thoughts for today. <laughs> you just seem so bitter today. We're like a pair of grumpy old men. What the hell? Well, I, you can see this stuff. You can see the failure to consider revenue design and what that's costing the state. You can see the failure of the governor to veto the right to threaten to veto the right thing. And what that's going to cost us in terms of an increased K through 12 bill, and you can see what's going on on the energy side, and the and the legislature is meddling in that, and what that's going to end up costing. You can see all this stuff coming. That makes you grumpy because you, because you can see the cliff out there. You know where it is. You know that we're speeding toward it, and and we've got people who just you know keep on adding more coal to the train. Yeah, that's the thing. Again, they could see that the bridge is out. Well, maybe you should apply. Oh, no, I think we'll make it. I think we can make it. Shovel some more coal in there. It'll be spectacular. Hold my beer. This will be fantastic. Uh, that's where we're at uh, right now. I couldn't uh, I couldn't agree more. All right, Brad. Well, thank you. I appreciate you coming on board, as always, and sharing with us. Michael, thanks for having me. God, it's so painful, isn't it? It's the worst when you can see it happening, when you're a sage in your own land and nobody else will listen to you. It's it's just painful. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.